part one on one with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Welcome to Art One on One. I am your pod boss, Nicole Jordan, alongside your professional artist and master educator, Mr. Berger. That's my title. You like your title. All right. Well, it's it's what I got. So here we go. Uh, kind of a different different operation this time, and hopefully, we'll be able to uh, create some great content for our pod people that view. We are on the road today. Just like Willie Nelson. On the road again. Oh, right, right. Not on the road today. Right. <clears throat> As you know. All right, well, let's start off by pulling our card and doing our segment on Ask the Art Guides. Ask the Art Guides is a segment that we have gone to more than any other. And this time, the conversation that we're going to be driven down is going to be surrounding J.M.W. Turner. J.M.W. Turner. Which I know nothing about. Yeah, he's, a, uh, he's an interesting character. Very um, romantic. Romantic painter. We talked a little bit about Romanticism, well, quite a bit about romanticism last week with William Blake. Uh, William Blake is another fairly prominent um, artist of that style. And uh, J.M.W. Turner is like that uh, in a lot of respects. They're both British. and uh, But J.M.W. Turner was most... Um, Known for painting bad weather. Yes. Bad, yeah. You know, good, good at painting storms and that sort of thing, and that's kind of where, what his calling card was. With that. So that's. I mean, what else is interesting about him? Interesting in, in seascapes, things like that. He actually started out as a kind of a map maker of sorts, doing map drawings, and then started doing naval ships and things like that, was also a huge proponent for ending slavery in Britain. Really? And uh, so he made several uh, paintings about that. Uh, one of note is called The Slave Ship, and that particular work uh, was to show the um, God's disapproval with the, the, uh, the act of slavery enslaving your own human beings and that sort of thing. When you say you helped, he helped out with that, what do you, what do you mean? How did he impact it? Uh, like I said, he made, he was outspoken about it. He gave money to it. He um, created art about he it. He created art about it. He was very vocal about the his disapproval for it. and uh, So he was an advocate through his artwork? For sure, yeah. More so than anything? Yes. And he almost, I think, I did watch your video on J.M.W. Turner, um, and he, didn't he, like, almost die doing art, like like a seascape or something like he, that? He did. He Well, he wanted to see what a tropical storm looked like, and so he had himself tied to the mast of a ship, and he had the ship go out into the a tropical storm so he could see it, and he almost drowned uh, doing that. I cannot imagine doing anything like that or like the people that chase tornadoes and storms oh, yeah. and get That's right in the middle spooky. of those and put what was that twister yeah. oh my gosh I hated that <clears throat> that was the first time I ever saw Philip Seymour Hoffman 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 Hoffman, Hoffman I think. Um, but I, that, that was the first time I ever saw him in a movie and he was just such like a hippie kind of a dude and, and uh, yeah I mean that's not really I, I don't know if that's how he really was, but I, I like that character, his, his uh, character in Twister. I, I went to the theater and saw that. I love that movie. Uh, I have, I have I a recurring dream about a tornado, so I 
I don't like any any type. Yeah, of... I saw it three or four times in the theater. I loved it. That was the only one they created, right? They didn't do like a second or anything else besides. Mm-hmm. I don't know where you could go from there, but I, yeah, I just don't. I don't know how those people do what they do. Yeah, I... like what drives them to want to get in the middle of such a dangerous. Same as JMW Turner. Like, what was he half mad or was he? His idea, as I understand it, was he wanted to see the storm. And the only way to really see it was to go inside of it and to really see it. And, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's probably one of those things where, you know, it's probably a good idea until you find yourself there. (laughs) And then, then what, what the hell was I thinking? What did I do? What did I just do? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I like the the life um, on this particular card. Just making sure it is life. But I'll get your perspective first on what you think it means or where you want to take the direction of it. But it says, find the facts in a feeling. Find the facts in a feeling. And I think that's what, like, that particular instance is really about. Like, he has a feeling of how he wants to present the storm or whatever. So he has to go in and find what that is, what that means, what that what that's about. And I think as people, as artists, I think we're often we often need to do that. Uh, we we it's not enough just to feel the way that we do. We have to go and explore it. We have to get a little bit deeper into um, you know why why is it that I feel that way? You know. For whatever reason, you know, it's like, like, however we feel, it's not enough just to have that feeling. We have to explore the feeling yeah. and why you have that feeling. Yeah, that's a lot of what we call or what I call in my work, shadow work, like figuring out what triggers you and why you're having the emotion or the feeling that you're having. Like, not just, you're, I mean, you are, I think in the old age, like, your parents, my parents, they were not taught that. They were like, suppress your feelings, work hard, move on, be tough. Probably because they had to be with kind of the things that they went through. Right. Um, but now, like, there's such a shift. And now it's, like, all about feeling your feelings, exploring your feelings, working through your feelings, talking about your feelings. It's like this huge shift shift that we've had in these past I don't know, a couple of years, maybe, maybe longer than that. I don't know. Very yeah, I, different than what the past has been. Yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, there, there are definitely generations that haven't done that. Well, it's kind of like that post that I made on uh, my page the other day. Do you remember what it was? It was like, show me your mom. What was that? Do you remember what it was? Show me your mom. It was like, show me someone's mom, and then I, I can understand oh, why. Like, what, like, show me, yeah, show me, show, introduce me to someone's mom, and I can tell you why they're in therapy or something yes. like that. Yeah, or like why they are the way they are right, or something like right, that. Right, right, right. And it's like, you know, I don't know. It was just so different in that I think our parents were just taught not to, like, you know, dive into that where we're all about, like, why do we feel the way we feel that it comes <clears throat> Our mom, our dad, our ancestors are, which I think is cool. But yeah, I'm sure there are reasons why we get into what we get into. Um, you know, some of that has to do with our parents. And some of that is also just, you know, like... Experience. Like, yeah, Experience. Like Experiences. There, there are a lot of people, like, for example, they'll say, well... Um, you know, their their child is in art class. Well, I'm not an artist, and their other parents not an, an artist, and and so we don't have any artists in our family. So I don't know where they come where they come by all this. And it's like, well, you know, sometimes I suppose it could be a genetic thing or a family thing or a whatever. And sometimes it's just a person's interested in something, and they pursue a path of trying to figure it out. And that's, that's fine. Do you think you're either born an artist or not born an artist? No. No. I think that, 
you more know, creative, I guess, is more. I think that there, there's certainly the, the nature versus nurture debate, but I also think that there's um, beyond the nature versus nurture debate. It's also a little bit of both and a little bit of none of it, you know. Um, for example, uh, one of the, the biggest examples of, of greatness in the art world ever is Michelangelo Bonarotti, the great Renaissance master sculptor. No one in his family was an artist. His dad didn't want him to be an artist. He, he just was compelled to do it. And his uncle and his dad both beat him to try to get him to not become an artist because they thought it would be a blemish on the family name to be to have an artist in the family and so eventually his desire and his you know what you can beat me I'm still going to do it um, and, and so they relented and said okay fine go be a failure artist if you want there goes the family name. Thanks a whole lot. But that's what probably made him as great as he was. It probably motivated him to be the artist, the artist that he was. Perhaps, but 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 the illustration of the point is that there was no family history. There was right. not a supportive family unit. He had neither of those things going for him. But he still was able to persevere and become arguably the greatest artist to ever live. So. Well, and I think I'm talking more about, like, the creative gene, you know, like having that talent or that, I don't know, that being able to be creative and paint and draw and things like that. Not as much as being, like, supported or right. like having a dad or a mom that was an artist. Like, is that something that if you, you know, you see a mom or dad that's very artistic, are their children likely to be artistic just because it's, I don't know, you know, how, like, athletes, there's families that just have strong athletes, or there are families that just have strong artists. That's what I was kind of alluding to. I think there's there's something to genetics, but there again, of my, all of my children, there's only one that's really had a strong drive to be an artist. Now, granted, all of my kids have had artistic experiences and things that they're kind of interested in from time to time. But, and again, and it's kind of unfair to say that because, I mean, Hank and Etta are pretty little. Yeah. So who knows? Who, who knows what they're going to do or what they're going to be? Um, my grown adult children were in art. They took art classes. They, they were around when I was doing uh, all kinds of uh, classes and all kinds of stuff. They had exposure to things that were way beyond what the average person probably was exposed to, and neither one of them were, right. were driven to go down a path of uh, art or cre maybe as a hobby, but not professionally. Right. And um, and that's fine. I mean, that's um, becoming an artist or being inclined in that way is one thing, but I think that both of them have an appreciation for art right. uh, in different ways um, th than maybe your average individual might. I don't know. You just talked about like experiencing art, and it made me think of um, a post that I was reading that you were kind of interacting with um, yes. the last couple of days, which um, was... Like, when I read it, I was, like, really intrigued by it because I don't remember exactly. It was it was a, in reference to an article that was talking about this, this person that was running a booth and looking at hiring people. And this girl came up to the booth, and she said she really probably wouldn't be worth anything to him or, or worth writing up a resume about herself because she was just raised on a farm and that's all she had known. She didn't have a lot of experience. And the article was about, you know, the, the benefits or the strengths or the, how important it is to have a 
child that's raised um, on a farm that has good work ethic and things like that. But then it brought up something about an artist, and I can't remember what specifically, how it was referred to, but I know you'll, um, I know you'll remember that. Well, it wasn't necessarily referencing an artist. What it, it, it said was that um, the exact quote escapes me, but it was something like, um, farm kids don't need to take art appreciation. And I took issue with that. <laughs> well, I did not when I read it. I will tell you, I did not. I could, I, I saw what they were saying and I saw like, I can appreciate both of those, right? Because right. I know you, because I know like my kids and I think it's, I do think it's really important to get them out there and get them working and experience those types of situations where they have to get up right. at six in the morning and they have to, you know, they have chores and they have to it's be responsible work. kids with a good work, work ethic. But I did like in your response, you talked about that. It has provided a lot of value, I think to you. And so I wanted you to talk a little bit about like, what do you think those experiences, the, those art experiences have maybe not in the sense of a resume, but like kind of in, yeah. in a resume, like what have they done for you or what has it done for you as a, a person. Well, I think, again, what they were saying in the article was that it's not easy to put farm work on a resume because, like, that's not real, like, you know, I shoveled poop and put it in a, in a wheelbarrow and I've fed cows and I've done this and I've done that, like, all of the different jobs and tasks that take place on a farm and to put that down on paper seems like, yeah, a bunch of grunt work. But it's all of those things combined are very good skills to have in terms of showing one's work and work ethic and, right. and all of those things. I think that those things are valuable. When I was growing up, when I was in high school and even from high school to college, uh, the two major jobs that I had was, number one, was working in daycare. I worked in daycares all over the place. But I also did a lot of farm work. Uh, I, and I pre predominantly worked on horse ranches. And uh, the first one was a boarding uh, ranch. And we shoveled manure and we got grain and we made sure that, you know, that we were getting... Uh, the, the hay and the, all of the different stuff for the horses. Um, when the vet would come, we'd have to make sure that they were in the arena. We would clean the arenas. We would, I mean, there was just tons and tons and tons of jobs and tasks that we had to do. And then I went on to a uh, thoroughbred racehorse ranch. And um, there I had to help with all kinds of tasks and mowing and um insulating barns and on and on and on helping to wean the the babies from the moms which thoroughbred racehorses do not like most animals don't but thoroughbred racehorses are very fast and very insane from my uh experience and they yeah unbelievable but but those jobs, those physical labor type jobs served me pretty well. And I think that what struck me was the fact that they said, well, farm kids don't need art appreciation. And I say, yeah, they do need art appreciation. Because just because you're a farm kid doesn't mean that you don't need to understand the culture of the of the world right just because you're a farm kid doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to have access to something beyond your small little corner of the earth um, i mean i grew up in a small little town in small little iowa in the middle of nowhere and i thought i want to see the world and so i've had the opportunity because i went out and i grabbed it i went out and i found a way to do it I've been to 16 countries around the world. I've been to uh, over half of the states across the United States. I've been to, um, you know, 
I've been to some great places and seen some really beautiful and amazing things. Whether you're talking about uh, just geography, you know, seeing uh, uh, Mount Vesuvius, I mean, standing on it, or um, sitting next to um, the most famous rivers in the world, going to the the most famous art museums in the world, going to the smallest countries and the biggest countries on our planet, going to uh, experience the most amazing things, uh, whether that's in Africa or Europe or North America, South America. I've seen lots and lots of really cool stuff. And I've been blessed to see a lot of stuff. And it helps me, a little guy from nowhere, Iowa, be able to put in perspective that, you know, I'm not better than anyone else because I've seen people in places that they have nothing be the most generous, welcoming, loving people when they got <clears throat> literally nothing to their name. But they'll help you with the smile. I've been to some really great countries where they have some of the most beautiful artworks and being able to see those things has helped me to recognize just the beauty of, of the world and cu cultural artifacts that the monuments men and other individuals have fought to make sure that those things are protected. These, you know, what is the value of Mona Lisa? You know, how important is the Mona Lisa? And we can say that it's not important until it's not around anymore. And then it's like, everybody's going to miss out. And because that shaped and changed so many things from the time that it was created until it became mainstream and everybody knew what it was. And it has a social impact. And to put an exact phrase on it doesn't do it justice. Looking at that situation, I just, I, I'm just wondering like what else it's provided for you as far as how yeah. it's impacted you. Well, and I why do you think it's important for ki other kids and people to experience well, those I things? Well, I think that, you know, it's like when you're, when you're from your little town, like for me, I'm from my little town and things run the way my little town runs and I see the things that I see in my little town and I really don't have to go beyond that. But then, you know, to go to an art museum and look at Asian art, to go to an art museum and see Native American art, to go to an art museum and see African art, lets me know that there's another way that humans have operated. It doesn't have to be the same as my little town and the way that things go. And so many times I've seen uh, people, well, you know, uh, I don't like them. I don't like that group. I don't like that religion. I don't like those people. I don't, they're not from my place. They're, they don't know how I live. Okay. How do they live? How is that different than you? Right. And through art, I've gained an appreciation for people that are Islamic. I've gained an appreciation for people that are Jewish. I've gained appreciation for people that were Greeks and Romans and, and uh, people that were practicing religions that I don't know anything about. But I know the beauty of the art and the artifacts that they created to, to pay homage to their beliefs. And then that opens up the door. Well, why do they believe that? Why do they think that? And then, oh, well, that's kind of like this. This is kind of like that. Then all of a sudden, there's a connection. Ah, that's not completely different from this story, which teaches this lesson 
which is exactly like the lesson that I learned in my little town at church camp or whatever. And so it makes the world that's so big and so different smaller and more like me and more understandable. And it's okay if they're black. It's okay if they're not like, they don't look like me. It's okay if their religion isn't exactly like mine. It's okay if they're, uh, if they're, some of their, their, the things that they do are different than what I do. Because there's a lot of things that we do that are the same. And it makes me okay with that. It makes me okay with, uh, the differences because there's a lot of similarities. And I think oftentimes in our world, we focus on how different they are. Look at them. They're different. They're different. They're different. Instead of, are we on the same page here? And, and there's a lot of times that we are. We just fail to see it because we're so in front of that wall of, oh, their religion's different than mine. They must be the enemy. No, 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 no. That's not, that's not true. So, and I think that more than anything, that's something that art has taught me. Uh, and I think that the art museum has become a much more inclusive place. It, back in the day, back in the old days, it was the white men's club. If you were in the art museum, you were a white man who was Protestant and doing their thing, and then that was it. Now you go to an art museum, it's very inclusive. You can see, just walking through an art museum, I'm looking at artwork from Asia, I'm looking at artwork from Africa, I'm looking at artwork from uh, the Native Americans, South America. Sure, I get some white male perspective. That's okay, too. I don't think I should be excluded from the conversation just because I'm a white guy. I want, I want people to see my artwork, too. But I also want them to see the female perspective. I want them to see the LGBTQ perspective. I want them to see the black perspective, the Asian perspective, that everybody has a voice. Everybody should have a place at the table to express their views and let those things be exchanged for the betterment of all of the kids and all of the people that are going to those museums to, to learn and grow and appreciate what's going down. Well, and I think you've talked about many times with me, because I tend to voice my opinion about not loving history, like, um, you learn, the, like, we learn those lessons from history so that we don't repeat those lessons. And I think art is a, is a way to experience that pieces of history and learn from that as well. So I think it provides culture for people, it provides perspective, it provides the ability to be grateful for what we have here versus what you know other I mean I'll never forget going to like going out of the country for the first time it was just so crazy to me how different people lived and how like when I was in the Netherlands for instance you, you couldn't get ice in a drink which was so crazy to me but then it made you appreciate that when you got home you know like so there's that appreciation too but um, well uh, uh, beyond that I think that that it helps you to appreciate what you do have, but it also makes you understand that there's another way to do it. Right. You don't have to have ice in your drink. Right. You might like to have the ice in your drink, but you don't necessarily have to have it in there. And some countries, they don't put it in there for a pretty good reason. And there's a lot of countries that I've gone to where I tell them, do not put any ice, do not put any water in my drink for that very reason. Right, right. But getting off uh, a little bit, though, I also think that it's very important for us not only to be able to go to that other country and say, yeah, there's no place like home. I'm glad to be back home and see those things. But I believe that, and I've said it before, I believe that every student should be required to travel abroad. And here's why. I think that there's a lot of kids that don't have any clue beyond their little little yeah. chunk of the earth. 
Okay, let, let's go to Germany. Let's go to France. Let's go to Spain. Let's go to Japan. Let's go to South America. Let's go to uh, Brazil. Let's go to Ecuador. Let's go to Honduras. Let's go, and I can go on and on and on just saying country names, but let's go there. And let's see how they live. Let's see how their food is. Let's see what their culture is. Let's look at their art. Let's look at their activities. And there's nothing more of a great learning experience from my perspective than taking a bunch of high school kids to an airport saying, okay, here's how you navigate the airport. Here's how you go. Go through the TSA. You go through the thing. You go through the detector. Oh, you can't have... Yeah, you dumb nut. You, I told you a list of stuff you can't take, and then they've got their toothpaste thrown away. Well, what am I supposed to do now? Now we learn. Now well, we learn. That's, as in anything, you learn through experience. You learn through experience. You learn through going. And th there's nothing that I've seen more quickly than a kid getting on an airplane in Detroit and ending up in Germany. And they get off, and then they've got dogs, and they've got uh, assault rifles, and they've got military yeah. people standing in, in the airport. And it's like, yeah, they're not playing. Yeah. You know, TSA, you can make all the jokes you want about it. they got a serious job to do. But but the, TS, the way TSA does it is is way different than some of these other countries that are, you know, you've got some serious military presence going on in the airports, especially the, the big international ones. So, and that kid looks at that, they see that situation, and they grow up, boom, yeah. like that. And that's, sometimes that's, oh, you know, they lost their innocence. But it's also, yeah. they grew up, they understood right. the seriousness, they know where they're at. And now, okay, now we can go forward and yeah. and we can learn. Well, I think just like, I mean, kind of bringing it all together, just like anything, just having that balance of all of those different things, you know, the balance of a good work, work ethic and be able to, being able to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and, hard, you know, endure hard labor, but also being someone that's traveling and experiencing things and being present and understanding what the world there's there's more to the world than just where right. we live in as you well and again i i can definitely appreciate sitting around doing nothing but i can also appreciate the value of all right get off your butt we're going to work you know um my dad allowed me my parents both allowed me the opportunity to you know sit and play and do your coloring but also hey no i need your help you're going to come and you're going to scoop snow. You're going to plow snow. You're going to, you know, I got work to do here. I got work to do there. I mean, lots and lots of jobs that I took on. And, um, you know, uh, it's one thing to go through the motions of high school and be able to pass your classes and do your thing and do the bare minimum of work and get the piece of paper that says, yep, you did it good job, and you have your mom and dad screaming like their heads off like, you know, idiots at the carnival, but, because I've, I've always hated that, people that are, Yay! like, oh yeah, you make a spectacle because your stupid ass kid just graduated <laughs> high school. I so did that. I know you True. did. <laughs> I know you did. But that's, I mean, I'm, yeah, but, I do feel, I but, felt it was... I, I never, felt it was good to do that. I felt I, I, would I wanted to celebrate that. Well, well and good for you. Differences are good. Good for you. Yes, thank you. But the the point is that you know that's wonderful to celebrate those things. But the reality is, you know, going through the motions and doing the bare minimum is just that. Going through the motions and doing the bare minimum. Did they work hard? Did they learn something? Did they, you know? There's nothing like, you know, that, that kid that just goes to school, and that's all they do is one thing. Right. But that kid that has to wake up at 6 o'clock and go to morning workout, has to go to two-a-day football practices, has to go to, you know, multiple, you know, things in the summertime. They've got to go to the, 
you know, the volleyball clubs and the, the cheer camps and the, the all of the things that kids have to do to compete and to get better and to improve and do all of those things and hit the gym and keep their grades up. That's, I mean, that those are the kids that, I mean, a lot of times like, uh, you know, people look down on them. Well, the same thing is true for that farm kid that has to wake up and do their chores and get their, you know, put on their mud boots and make sure that things are going right. You know, that's, the, you know, that kid isn't getting a whole lot of praises other than, you know, yeah, you did it. Yeah. Good job. Well, you know, give that kid a little bit of, you know, they're, they're working hard. They're busting their ass to make sure that they're, they're getting to school on time and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, they're, I think that the, the athlete should be recognized, the farm kid should be recognized, the art kid should be recognized, because I guarantee you, there's a lot of kids that I've taught over the years who do some fantastic works that there's a, there's a whole uh, huge percentage of the world population could not do what right. those kids do. Right. And, and that goes for the work, it goes for the athletes, it goes for there are lots of kids that can do stuff. That the, the you know older generations wouldn't want to do or couldn't do. Right. So anyway, that's my soapbox on it. Yeah, you kind of kind of got off on a tangent. Tangent, yes, but make sure you hit that subscribe button and follow along with all the exciting things on Art One Hundred and One and Art One on One with Mister Burger and the Pod Boss. You can find content on Spotify, YouTube all over the place, and we very much appreciate your support and your ability to share these things with others. Awesome. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.